I thought, fine, that's a very a positive word. It has this sense of moving forward into a healthier way of thinking about our subject. But I think we need to look at the backstory, regeneration to what end, and why do we need to think about regeneration in order to provide some clarity to what we're talking about. And in particular, my main focus is on the notion that the city is not a self-contained <coughs> space with buildings and roads and civilians and all the other apparatus of cityness but that cities exist within a larger context of a planet, a world, a bioregion, without which the cities would not exist. And to me, it's one of the mysteries of the world that you imagine that cities could be discussed separately from the, the planet and the ecosystems and the living systems that they depend on. So my subtitle is about urban-rural reconnection, because that, as far as I'm concerned, is the precondition for thinking about regeneration as a driver of cities moving forward. And I wanted to just start with um, this picture of a drop of rainwater. A man called Simon is a rather wonderful scientist who magnifies by 200 times or more things that are very common, like you walk through a forest and onto your hand falls a drop of water. When magnified 200 times, that drop contains thousands billions of microorganisms, bacteria, and other things, forms of life that we know so little about, we can't name more than a few percent of them. They interact with each other in ways that we only barely understand. So walking through the forest onto your hand in one drop of water is a world of life that is kind of almost unknown to us, but magical in its complexity and its vastness. And compare that as a kind of mental picture of our context of a city to the notion of cities as machines and complexes of technology and data that we heard about yesterday. And it's not that one is good and one is bad. To me, the mystery and the mystery that designers, I think we have the opportunity to kind of reconnect, is that these two worlds should exist so separately from each other. I didn't hear the word biodiversity or energy or living systems once yesterday. Very brilliant engineers from all over the world. But they exist in a, in a world of what they think is abstraction. But actually, the most, and the reason that we have such a kind of difficulty in our work is that this abstraction is actually very material. And so that, I mean, this notion that uh, we deal with uh, immaterial things is just one of the fancy fantasies of the techno um, kind of technocratic understanding of reality. And that's best if I show you this example, because about, I should say, 50% of all engineers and tech people and artificial intelligent people say, oh, well, it will be in the cloud. So you've heard we all talk about the cloud. <laughs> the cloud sounds like a nice, white, fluffy thing, correct? In which kind of birds fly around in clouds and they float gently through the sky. This is not actually the whole picture. This is the cloud. This is one of many server farms scattered around the world. This one belongs to the American National Security Agency. It's a very large uh, facility that processes trillions of um, terawatts of data. In order to function securely, they put it in the middle of a desert, a very hot, dry environment. But in order for the machinery not to crash, they use three million gallons of fresh water every day to keep this cool. So that is the cloud. And there are hundreds of such facilities around the world, all are being added to and expanding all the time. Is it smart to need three million gallons of fresh water in the middle of a desert? I'm not personally sure that it's so smart. But that is before you even look at the amount of power needed to power this cloud. A friend of mine called Benjamin Bratton, some of you may have heard of his book called The Stack. If you add together all the apparatus and the infrastructure of the worldwide information, artificial intelligence, digital world, something like 17 terawatts a day, which is getting on for 40% of the power used to run the whole of civilization, that's pretty amazing. And not one word about this was uttered yesterday. We just have images and talk about 
information flows of information and so on, as if information is light and the rest of the world is heavy. No, information is probably the heaviest thing of all. So when we talk about regeneration, I think we need to bear in mind that we're we not to the technology world and the data world and the AI world is not some separate reality. It is the same reality, but insofar as we have a crisis of transformation and sustainability, the fact that we don't think about that is one of the ways that we have to fix it. And it's not, as I said, I need to repeat this, some of my best friends are engineers. It's not that engineers are bad people or that we are good people. It's in some very mysterious way we have enabled a civilization to emerge in which we are physically and cognitively separated in our city lives, in our technical lives, in our <coughs> process lives from the living world of which we are a part. What people have called the metabolic rift, the metabolism of the natural world and the metabolism of the economy in some very, it's madness, have been separated. And so, as far as I'm concerned, regeneration in cities or anywhere else is about reconnecting those two so that they become one. And that's what I will talk about for the rest of my introduction. Three parts. So, insofar as we're trying to reconnect the economic and the social and the living in ways that are, have quality and as you said, create social value as well as economic success, I want to revisit uh, this notion of what is valuable about regeneration and not just doing it in random way. You know, what is the value that we will create? A few words on that. Secondly, which again Ezio touched on, can we be confident that all these small projects, the grassroots projects, the seeds that are growing from the wreckage of the old, are, are we realistically, are we not kidding ourselves that they can be the basis of transforming and replacing the system which is doing so much damage to the planet. And then thirdly, I will be one of many speakers over the next couple of days to talk about what can we say about the infrastructure needed to turn these small things into the bigger connected picture of system transformation. So value. It's important that we think about value because if we don't think about value, then we just make things completely randomly um, because some kind of indicator says that uh, we will be judged by that. I think that regeneration is a missing ingredient that refocuses our intention on what matters, what should be counted. It's a story that reconnects things. As I said, this rift between the natural world and the economic world. Regeneration connects them together. Um, urban and rural is what I mentioned at the beginning. It's just uh, we have got to stop being so infantile in imagining that cities feed themselves, that we breathe the air that comes from where, that the water and the uh, living systems generally. So we need to reconnect that in our notion of what is valuable about the actions we're planning to take. We need to reconnect thinking about cities and the soil that the cities are built on, the soil from which the food is grown that we eat, and so on and so forth. They are not separate stories, they are one story. Now it may seem that they're different sitting in this kind of artificial environment, but we're designers. It is our task to remove these obstacles to this reconnection between the city and the soil. And in the same way as I said, the notion that biodiversity is some subject, that it's part of subdivision of nature over here that we have to look after, and that the economy is some kind of greater separate reality over there. It's a form of madness, it's a form of sickness that we have, all part of this sickness. Design, how do we stop those two stories being separated in our minds and in our practices? And man's nature and nature's internet, I mean, I, my work started 25, 20, 30 years ago, celebrating and being amazed by the internet as a kind of wonder of the world. And all those years I've always been the internet is an amazing thing. All that time, me and you, we were standing on a world in which nature's internet was a marvel of connectivity and information sharing and ecosystem balance that we knew more or less nothing about because we didn't look. It's only in the last 10 years that the scientists have managed to explain to the rest of us that nature's soil contains connectivity, which is as amazing as our man-made internet but slightly more impressive because it doesn't need 
external sources of energy and nutrients to keep it going. It's a self-sustaining internet, unlike, as I showed you before, with the cloud. Go on. And if we think of regeneration of making our places healthier, our places and our bodies and our bacteria, they're not separate things. We can probably agree on that. The health of where we live and the health of our bodies is the health of our children and the health of their children is a very important, nothing could be more important. The health of our places is important. Therefore, why do we imagine that they are separate subjects? So maybe making our places healthier is a better way of measuring value and progress than abstract measures like data or GDP or money. <coughs> so I'm just going to leave that there. This, as far as I'm concerned, we are designers. How we implement that in terms of getting people's heads around that care for place is more important in value than care for money, that's a, that's a, sub, that's a detail compared to the basic value proposition. And it's social ecological and economic value being present in a place is a, such a simple proposition if we can get rid of all our distractions then that becomes a way to focus the diverse energies that we need to bring together so uh, people have talked for 50 or 60 years about how do we replace gross domestic product and the evils of modern economics care for place is there for us all to grab it's not complicated so takeaway number one of three, regeneration creates value. You can't just pretend that we don't need to create value. But it moves to me, and I spent 30 years being frustrated about people saying we should do less harm. We should grow the business, we should grow the economy, we should sell more products, but we should do less harm. I don't want to live the rest of my life doing less harm. I want to live the rest of my life leaving things better and I would be surprised if maybe you don't think something like that too. So part two is, okay, and I've spent a lot of my life looking around the world for examples of people doing things, meeting daily life's needs in ways that are healthier than the ways that the present system uh, forces us to do. But as Ezio said, and all of you are very, having this discussion every day, can we rely on small projects and grassroots social innovation? Is that it in terms of an alternative? And actually it is. Actually, I, I'm not sure. I think the top-down stuff is a kind of support, but not an equal part of it. Thomas Lemay, the Belgian designer, these are words written physically on the on a high school in Belgium. The next big thing will be a lot of small things. I think it's such a brilliant slogan to put on a school. Um, but it's where, you know, design of common sense meets science. And so the, the, the world of systems thinking and complex systems is um, over, what, three, through 30 or 40 years, I think this is my single favorite quote from that whole body of knowledge, namely, when a system is far from equilibrium, which is the system that is going crazy all around us, when it's far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence have the capacity to change the bigger system. So as far as I'm concerned, the projects that we do in our communities, in our fields, in our small scale, those are the small islands of coherence that are the basis for the replacement system that we're looking for. And once you think of small as good, it becomes actually a lot more good news than we realize. So I live in France, and the, here is just one amongst you know, a whole possible different ways of looking at the sheer growth of projects which are transformative on a small scale. But when you look at a map of all these projects together, there are thousands. So this is, I think, a, a kind of, there's an organization called the Colibri in France, which it makes a sort of map of social and solidarity projects. I think there are 11 or 1100 on that picture. That's one filter, one country. Same country, different filter, and projects in which citizens connect with people growing their food. That is a different filter, different organization. But again, five years ago, there would have been, I think, 50 or 60 green marks on that map. Now there's more than 1,000. These are live examples of people reconnecting with food from a city or peri-urban context using platforms like La Rouche and so on, which we could talk about later. So small actions multiplying start to become big. And as Ezio said, 
System transformation is about scaling horizontally, not taking small things and turning them into big things. So this is, you just to see, making lines between places, between people, between assets, between qualities, saying what can we do to improve the performance of one bit, <coughs> one food project, one care project, one co-housing, but also what can we do to connect them to each other in ways that improve them. So takeaway number two, system transformation is not just about a nice little project, but system transformation is about scaling out, not scaling up. And as far as I'm concerned, that provides a framework for thinking about what designers can do on top of what we do now, is designing the relationships between the bits, which I'll come back to a bit in a moment. So part three, social infrastructure. What kind of um, tools or support systems or platforms do we need to do more of this, to do this scaling horizontally, to help individual projects improve, but also to help them to collaborate with each other? Uh, and I think it's an important question, although I must say, as I mentioned just now, I have come to the conclusion that sometimes people like me say, oh, we, must, we need a support system to help people to collaborate. And I used to run a big conference called Doors of Perception, and we had a thousand people would come for three days. And every time I would worry at the end of the conference, we should do more to help people meet each other. We need a database. We need a mating system. We need a kind of we need a something to help people connect. And over the years, I realised that I should just stop worrying so much, because uh, every year a thousand people would come and meet, and amazingly enough they would get to together by themselves without me introducing them. People would find each other. And in the world of social change, that happens every day, every minute people are finding each other when they need to. So I'm actually more, uh, less sort of passionate about the need for connection frameworks than I was probably 10 years ago. Yes, we need connections to be made, but they don't need to be complicated, expensive, or um, elaborate. And this, I have to say, is my years going to India is where I learned about the difference between formal infrastructure and informal infrastructure. So one of the events we did in 2005, when we discussed platforms for social innovation in Bangalore, and we had various people from the US and Europe saying, well, we need all sorts of structures and arrangements were proposed with the internet and the knowledge management. One minute. And uh, the beauty of the situation is that you walk out of the convention center and there would be millions of people doing all sorts of stuff on the street without the participation or the advice of designers. We need to look for sort of interventions which are supportive but not, so to speak, a directive. And so that's what I did from that moment onwards to look for examples of where not we could design interactions but support and enable interactions, which is in my last book. I'll tell you about in the coffee break. In other words, not trying to invent from my head or from a design studio the answer, but to look for answers that existed and see how we could do to enhance their performance. And just three or four examples now of the next generation of this notion of support. This is in London, participatory city. If, if you haven't heard of it, you should check it because this is a kind of five-year program of supporting existing grassroots activities in a very designed way in which the top half of that circle is the reality of a city with all the stuff that's already happening and the bottom half of the circle is the support system that can be designed and put into place. That to me is a very powerful image of how we don't have to take responsibility for the whole thing our job is to look for the supporting elements and interventions that we can do. And they can be as complicated as opening a shop called a project shop, which I know many of you have done similar things. But this has been a kind of a good example of where simple interventions support complex changes that they don't know what will happen as a result of that project shop opening. Since I've been given a last minute warning, I will jump through five or six. Um, if you haven't heard of Fibershed, look it up. But I wanted to just emphasize that this is about 
a bioregional economy in which lots of people collaborate to, in this case, use wool from sheep in a better way, bioregional scale, but with a global superstructure of design and knowledge, namely Ravelry, which is the global uh, community of six million knitters and wool fanatics who help the local physical basis work. Uh, I got a, this is what Professor Liu was mentioning earlier, and I know that the, the, the Fodji has been involved in exploring ways in which the city can begin to rethink and reanimate and revitalize the rural economy. I know very little about it. What I do know is that the difference between what happens here in Europe and in the US and other places, the differences are very large in terms of uh, detail, but very smaller in terms of content, because it's all about fashioning connections between cities and rural situations about we don't know about. And what's so fascinating to me is that we all have, city people have, in the countryside is some sweet place with little villages. The countryside, nature, is actually um, existing within the global system of distribution and logistics that we've been talking about. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm very keen to know what Alibaba thinks it's going to do by plugging in 400,000 rural convenience stores into its network. It raises the question of whether this is do we want to pump the countryside full of junk as well as the city? Probably not, but that's why we have to change the value question, which we can talk about in discussion. And to finally, I'm sorry, I'm going a couple of minutes over, back to England, city and country, not just buying stuff, but participating together in the, in this case, the growing of wheat in the field, the cooperative grains movement, What's wonderful about this is that you have you know, city people and country people and farmers operating in a very rural situation and activity, namely growing grain. But they are using very modern tools, namely Lumio, designed by these guys in New Zealand, to organize their discussions. So the people in the field in England use software and governance tools designed in New Zealand, put those two things together, city, country, global, local. It's very powerful. And that's what I, I want to get, because always when I'm talking to a group of predominantly city people, they get nervous about uh, a flight from the city. Relational design, I call it, uh, when working with some people in Wales, and I just wanted to finish on this picture of the thing that bugged me most yesterday was this notion of connecting people together is like a Lego game. There must have been three separate presentations yeah. yesterday in which people from MIT said, making the city is a mapping they can remember. I can kind of quickly plugging things in and they all go together. Connecting human beings does not is the same as making a Lego brick model. It takes time, it takes trust, it takes empathy, it takes love, it takes all sorts of things which are not commonly found in a box of Lego. And so in this case, here you have on the left, some farmers who are growing food in a new kind of permaculture, bionic way. On the right is a town in Bangor in Wales with a fantastic cafe looking to reconnect the food with the people. It cannot be done easily. It takes weeks and months of discussions and meetings and trust to make that connection happen. So, uh, three takeaways and then I'll stop. Takeaway one, regeneration creates new value and it moves us from doing less harm to leaving things better. That provides the story to motivate us to do things that have been sounded sad until now. Takeaway two, system transformation is about scaling out, not scaling up. It's such an important thing because we're surrounded by politicians and policymakers who are well-intentioned, the big foundations. They cannot get it into their heads that small can be relevant. Scaling out answers that question. Takeaway three, scaling out, creating new urban relationships, new urban rural relationships is a fantastic opportunity for design. And it's something which we are gonna to have to learn to do relatively fresh. It's not something that we can look up in books. The kind of work that I'm doing with my friends in Wales is part of that picture. Uh, and a bonus takeaway number four, 
Um, that's my <laughs> book. Thank you, Professor Liu, and thank you to the school for making this happen. I am so excited about this, and we'll tell you in one minute more during the coffee break. Uh, but thank you so much for your attention.